And that's why I don't think that there's a need to take a four hour deposition of a half a dozen different people again. Judge, please give me something. Just give me something. <laughs> you know, that, I you have. Do? Give me more than six questions. Good morning. Good morning. Campbell Williams on behalf of the plaintiffs. Donald Drew Campbell, Campbell Williams on behalf of the plaintiffs. Good morning, Your Honor. Colby Williams on behalf of the plaintiffs. Good morning, Your Honor. Lawrence Balanowski on behalf of the party defendant, Jim Patrick Ray. Good morning, Your Honor. Christopher Zettenfeld on behalf of William Ray as well. Kevin Smith, Paul Jack and Clayton for the Jewish individual. Good morning, Your Honor. Sean Payne for Defendant Scott and Craig Jewish. Good morning, Your Honor. Brett Godfrey for defending our own construction as well as the effect as well. Good morning. So it's on today for a motion to bifurcate and exclude the uh, O'Fikens, Welch, defendants, and Arno. And a, and a motion to continue. Which motion would you prefer to hear first, Your Honor? Well, you got a lot of people waiting for you, so I'm not going to let you guys take the whole calendar today. So how about you do whatever you want in uh, 20 minutes? Okay, Your Honor, I'll go fast. Um, would you like me to argue both motions, or should we do them one at a time? You can argue both of them. All right, I think they're related. I'm sorry, say again. <laughs> related? I believe they are. Well, to an extent they are. Um, but let me point out to the court, I think that the, the bifurcation question doesn't have to be resolved now if the continuance is granted. We can put that off to a later date. And um, so for the sake of judicial efficiency, let me begin with the motion to continue the trial. The, uh, the briefing in the case frames the issues pretty well, and I know this court is very diligent in reviewing the written submissions of both sides. But I'd like to just emphasize that R&O is a separate legal entity, and a corporation has the same rights as an individual. No individual could be forced to try a case without the benefit of conducting any discovery, designating any expert, or having the opportunity to do those things established as right by the rules of civil procedure in preparation for trial. A fair trial means that the party has the same chance as his opponent to prepare his case for trial. Now, the plaintiffs, for reasons only they know, decided not to bring RNO in sooner. It sounds like what they've placed in their brief uh, makes it sound that they've had a clarity of mind about RNO's involvement in the case forever. In fact, in one of their briefs, actually the brief in opposition to the bifurcation motion, they point out that they gleaned all they needed from the discovery conducted prior to RNO's involvement in the case to proclaim unilaterally that the allegations that would support either direct liability on the part of mm -hmm. RNO, which is recognized in the Nevada Supreme Court's uh, determination not to permit our writ, uh, that those claims against RNO include both veil piercing and direct claims. Now, the, the idea behind the direct claims has been argued many times in this courtroom. I won't belabor it, but it basically boils down to the idea that RNO uh, was a de facto member of a cabal that was running the water park, and as, as well as a target for reverse veil piercing through the ownership of that company alleged by the plaintiffs by Orliff Ophikas. Orliff doesn't own stock in RNO, and the Nevada Supreme Court held that that by itself is not dispositive as to the question of whether or not RNO could be brought in at this stage in the proceedings. They didn't say it's not a factor, they simply said it's not a dispositive factor by itself. The point I'm making is that in those averments and in the brief on that subject, plaintiffs have alleged that this is like a slam dunk sort of thing. And if you don't allow an opponent in a case to conduct discovery, file motions that it deems fit, and participate in the pretrial process to the same extent as the other side, it is a slam dunk. That's what we call trial by ambush. Now what Arno needs in this case is not some long, horrendous pushback. We are mindful of the five-year rule, and we have submitted in our briefing that we can meet the five-year rule and still afford the interests of justice to Arno that it deserves. It has a constitutional right to prepare its own case for trial. Now, the plaintiffs make much of the fact that I represent the O'Fikens Welsh individual defendants, 
and I've been in the, involved in the case for months, and therefore RNO must be prepared for trial. That is absolutely an incompetent argument. I don't mean the counsel's incompetent, they're very competent. But the argument itself cannot carry water because every party has a right to independently prepare meaningfully for trial. Now RNO is a construction company, and until they prove that RNO is nothing but the alter ego of orlithophycans, or vice versa, depending on their veil piercing slash reverse veil piercing, until they prove it, the law presumes that RNO is a corporation. It is a separate entity, and it's just like bringing a new individual into the case. It's exactly the same thing as bringing the brokers into the case. The brokers argued successfully that they shouldn't have to prepare for trial on short notice. No, no, to no less force does that apply to RNO. They have other shareholders besides Orla, who isn't one. They have employees. They have creditors. They have customers who have huge financial interest in the ongoing solvency of RNO. So to simply just cut them off at the knees and say, well, you know, uh, you've got a lawyer who's been involved in the case for uh, nearly a year. Uh, you don't get to do anything on your own. That would be an absolute constitutional violation of the right to due process. Well, what do you think RNO wants to do? What does RNO want to do that's different from, or in addition to what's already been done? That puts me in a dilemma, Your Honor, because it requires me to divulge my mental impressions, my strategies, my tactics in advance just to get a fair trial. They don't have to do that. Now, but they're the ones that have the burden. So if, if, if you think that RNO was brought in so late, it, wouldn't that be to the detriment of the plaintiffs that have the burden of proof as opposed to RNO? That's for them to say, Your Honor. My, my point is simply this, and I don't mean to be coy with the court. I can tell you that what RNO needs to do is it needs to depose the fact witnesses in the case. When RNO was first brought into this case, I was not involved in this matter in any way, shape, or form. But by the time I was first hired, and I'd like to just point this out as an interesting note, I was brought in initially to defend RNO. Only after I successfully persuaded the court to dismiss the claims without prejudice, only then was my role expanded to include the individuals. But by that time, Your Honor, by the time RNO was first named in the case and quickly released from the case, the principal fact discovery was complete with respect to underlying facts that directly influenced RNO's exposure in the case. So no lawyer for RNO participated in the deposition of the plaintiffs. No lawyer for RNO participated in the deposition of Armani Hansen or William Ray. No lawyer for RNO participated in other fact depositions, <laughs> the testimony from which is argued by plaintiff as basically hanging RNO. <coughs> so RNO stands accused of you know, a fait accompli liability without ever having a chance to materially defend itself except in the successful motion to dismiss. It got back in the case, and until it was back in the case, it was out of the case. The total duration of its time in the case is very, very short. Within 18 days of RNO being back in the case, we filed the motion for continuance. So RNO, if it is forced to ride the coattails of other parties' discovery, that is no, by no means going to amount to a fair trial. Now, whether the plaintiffs, whether you could look at it in different lights, I'm telling you, this party demands a chance to prepare for trial meaningfully to the same degree as the other parties in the case have, especially to the same degree the plaintiffs have. And I contend that if we give due credit to their arguments that there's a lot that doesn't need to be redone, we can sacrifice the extra years of preparation that the plaintiffs have. But we got to have more than the time between now and October. We have to have the time to endorse our own experts after we take our own depositions. Everybody else gets to do that. Why don't we? We have to have that. Now, does that mean we need to redo everything? Absolutely not, because I'm not suggesting that you give us enough time to do such a thing. I'm not asking for that. I'm saying that we need to stay uh, uh, on a balance here between the five-year rule and the interest of fair play. It would not be fair. It would be fundamentally unfair <coughs> to deprive RNO of the same preparation time and tools that the civil rules give the plaintiffs 
And merely because they have the burden of proof doesn't mean a defendant must be bound hand and foot and prevented from using the tools afforded by the rules to prepare meaningfully for a trial. Okay. Now, if you want, I'll move to the bifurcation question. Yep. The bifurcation issue is related to the extent that it affects the timing of the trial, but in no other way is it really affected, is it really related to the continuance issue. The bifurcation motion stands on its own. I simply suggested that if we win the continuance, we could put off the bifurcation, but if we do the bifurcation today, the last major hearing we had in this courtroom was on my unsuccessful motions for summary judgment for both Arno and the Ficus Lost Defense. Mr. Campbell had arranged to bring a TV camera into the courtroom. He provided interviews to those uh, news professionals. They never reached out to me to hear my side of the story. They got a sound bite of the back of my head, which isn't that attractive. I didn't know I was that bald back there until I saw that news. And that spawned hundreds and hundreds of postings on social media, which had all sorts of public uh, notions in them that will help us with jury selection. But the concept is that in the video that was shot or was played on Channel 8 that day, they showed scenes of Leland Gardner, who is admittedly very, very disabled. He's very, very young. His parents care for him. In the trial, the plaintiffs intend, they've shot more than one day in the life video. Now, a day in the life video to an experienced litigator is nothing more than a tool to elicit sympathy. Leland Gardner's appearance in the courtroom will be difficult and strenuous for him and for his parents, yet they contend they must have him here. He cannot materially participate in his defense. The law is replete with case law identifying when a party isn't competent to participate in his or her own trial. And what he, what he serves the purpose of doing in this case is to trigger a massive tsunami of sympathy. Now the plaintiffs have accurately argued that you can presume that jurors will follow instructions up to a point and no further. That's why Rule 52 specifies that this is an adequate remedy when the sympathy is so strong that the court in its reasoned discretion realizes that the force of the sympathy in the case, and sympathy should never, ever, ever be the basis of a verdict, ever, and we tell them that, but when the evidence is this compelling, we simply cannot reasonably rely for the sake of a fair trial on the notion that a juror will absolutely turn into an android or a Vulcan and turn off his emotions at the flip of a switch. There are no jurors in this town that can do that, I suspect. They're people. They're humans. They will feel sympathy. And when it comes time to determine the amount of damages, then I have to live with that sympathy. But if that sympathy is staring those jurors in the face at a distance of two inches when they're trying to hear evidence about medical causation, about timing, about how long the lifeguard took to get there, about you know what, what actually uh, did or did not cause those injuries, which the score has already said are fact issues. If those are to be reasoned out by a sober, sane jury, they must not be burdened by crushing overwhelming levels of sympathy. We have cited a substantial, and I mean substantial, body of authority for the assertion that we should get a, 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 a clarification of liability causation on one hand and damages on the other. And the plaintiffs make much in their briefs about the fact that you have, they, talk, they cite the, the uh, uh, I think it was called the Veneer case. And uh, in that case, there was an intermingled question of medicine. Vernon. Sorry? Vernon. Vernon, thank you, I apologize. Uh, the point here is that, that we have proposed what we think is an adequate solution that will not prejudice the plaintiffs a bit. Not a bit will they be prejudiced. They, they will be disappointed because they'll lose the thermonuclear warhead of the sympathy bomb, but they will not be legally prejudiced in any way by the granting of this motion. What we propose is that we inform the jury that Leland Gardner has a profoundly severe brain injury just tell them that fact. And, and I believe we could stipulate that that was caused by a prolonged period of lack of oxygen to the brain as a result of a prolonged cardiac arrest. Now, there, the, the information of a medical nature that would need to come in
come in in that phase of the trial would be limited to medical causation questions. It would be chronologically limited to the duration of time covering the moment uh, from when Leland Gardner went under water to the moment when Leland Gardner's heart was restarted with, at that point in time, permanent and irreversible brain injury caused by lack of oxygen. The evidence the jury would hear on, on medicine would be limited to causation. The, the existence and fact of damages would be a stipulated fact in the first phase of the trial. But we do not need the jury who listens to cardiology testimony on causation or who listens to testimony about how long Leland was underwater or how long it took Armani to spot him and get him out. We don't need that jury hearing before they decide those issues that it's a, it's a nightmare every day to have Leland Gardner's injuries as bad as they are, to take care of your son when he's that badly hurt. These are horrendous pieces of, of information. And Mr. Campbell, we have a sense, just a vague sense, of how we think Mr. Campbell will try the case. And he will probably do a masterful job of pulling on the heartstrings of those jurors and using that sympathy, that impermissible sympathy. And it is impermissible. There is no question the law supports me on that statement. Sympathy must be filtered out. That's why Rule 52 says what it says. It says to avoid prejudice. You could look at this and say in the law, there are patterns and patterns of legal doctrines that are designed to filter sympathy out of a fair trial. You know, we have Rule 403. This isn't a 403 motion. But it is often the case that probative evidence is excluded by a court from a trial simply because of the unfair prejudice, the sympathetic nature of that evidence carries with it. So here, I don't suppose that we're going to say that we exclude from the entire proceeding the evidence of damages when they come in with an economist who talks about the loss of income and earning capacity, and they come in with a uh, life care plan specialist who talks about years and years and years of expensive medical care needed. I'm not saying we exclude it totally. I'm saying that we get certain decisions made first. And as I said, the body of law supporting that is substantial. If we do not do that, the likelihood of a fair trial is reduced drastically. If we do do that, the likelihood of a fair trial is much higher. And fairness should be the only decision that, that and the only factor that governs your decision today, Your Honor, fairness. Give us a chance to try liability and causation without that overwhelming prejudice. And if they succeed, then they can put in the bomb and, and play the day in the light video and have the parents crying on the courtroom and have the jury see how horribly injured Mr. Gardner is. And all of that still comes in. But they meet their burden of proof in isolation element by element which they would normally be able to do in a different type of case. If they had a five mile an hour rear end collision, nobody would soberly make an argument like this. But it is common to separate out punitive damage from this. It is mandatory in, in Nevada. You will do that, I'm sure. But uh, the idea of, of not giving us this remedy, which was crafted for exactly this case, says we'll take the entire case merely for a matter of convenience, perhaps, to get it over with. And we will reduce the fairness of this trial, just because it seems easier. That's not, that's not a good thing, you know, with all respect. That's all I have. Thanks.
We're here for the court's order to show cause. Okay, so that takes care of one motion. Maybe somebody could tell me what the status is. Any preliminary issues we need to take care of? We'll make sure that she's put on house arrest. No, the Supreme Court has. Okay, why don't you give me the statute? I'm not putting up with any of the crap here today. I know there were joiners, I think, with this. No? We had a joiner, we have nothing further to add. We get the joiner's argument. Go ahead, Mr. Williams. Good morning, Your Honor. Holy Williams, and with the court's permission, I was just going to handle the continuance issue, and Mr. Markovich was going to handle the bifurcation. That's all right. Yeah. Ten minutes each. And, Judge, I'll get right to the point. I know you've got a crowded courtroom. Look, no one is arguing that R&O doesn't have due process rights as a party in this case. No one's arguing that. Your Honor, the point is that R&O's due process rights have been satisfied here, and to the extent that they claim they need to do discovery on the alter ego issue, which I'll talk about in a minute, we can satisfy those, too. In fact, we've been begging them to satisfy that, and they will not engage in self-help by serving us with any discovery. So we'll talk about that in a minute. But let's talk about due process, because it's a flexible concept. The Nevada Supreme Court tells us that, and it depends on the facts and circumstances of the situation. So what are those facts and circumstances here? R&O is in as an alter ego defendant only. The claim is premised on the underlying negligence claim we have against Orlip O'Pikins. And no one in this courtroom can dispute that the defendants have had abundant opportunity to do all the discovery they want with respect to the negligence claim against Mr. O'Pikins. Godfrey Johnson has been in this case for a long time, Judge. They came up with an alternative theory with respect to how this incident happened to suggest that they have not been able to lead the defense in this case and plot the strategy is just not squared with the facts, Judge. So we've got to establish negligence against Orliff first, and then we have to establish the alter ego elements against R&O. Your Honor, no one, just like Mr. Campbell's going to get up and present the trial in a persuasive and compelling manner, I'm sure they will too on behalf of Orliff, Your Honor. They're going to have that chance. So no due process is being deprived on the underlying claim. So. Let's talk about uh, the alter ego defendant, Your Honor. We cited to you the Cali case from the Nevada Supreme Court, which dealt with a situation where a party with a judgment creditor at that point had obtained a judgment and then sought to add an alter ego defendant by way of leave to amend. Just add that party to the judgment. And the Nevada Supreme Court said, no, you can't do it that way. That would deprive the uh, alter, alleged alter ego defendant of due process. You've got to file an independent claim, bring them in, and they get to do discovery. But Judge Cali is most notable for what it doesn't say. That alter ego defendant, yes, they're entitled to be brought in by way of a new lawsuit, but they don't get to come in and challenge the underlying judgment, all the discovery that was done to get to the original underlying judgment. And that's what RNO is saying it gets to do. We get to come in now and do all the discovery over again. No, they don't, Judge. And I think that's what's most important about Cali. Now, 
With respect to, I mean, I've heard this and you saw it in the briefs, like basically it's our fault for bringing, for bringing RNO late. Judge, we, we sought to bring RNO in more than a year ago. They moved to dismiss, they prevailed, we went to the Supreme Court, we got it reversed, we're now back. But Judge, we moved with alacrity. We sought expedited treatment in the Supreme Court and they gave it to us and they came down in June and said, we're reversing, RNO can go back in the case. And the Supreme Court was well aware of our trial schedule. In fact, they thought our trial was in September because that's what we had told them because that's what it was at the time. It got pushed back a month. They didn't express any great concern about RNO's due process rights, Your Honor. But to the extent they want to do discovery on the alter ego issue, okay, we get that, Judge. And we asked them, when they filed this motion to continue, and we had a chance to read it, Mr. Irwin wrote emails in, their, in our brief at Exhibit 2, tell us what discovery you want on the alter ego claim. And Mr. Bale, not uh, Mr. Goffrey, Mr. Bale answered and said, this is what we want to do. And what was our response? Serve it. Serve your interrogatories. Get them to us now. We'll take a look at them, and we'll respond on an expedited basis. That was August 23rd, Judge. What have we heard? Crickets. Not a word. They aren't interested in serving this discovery. They want, this is a pretext. You've seen it in a variety of ways, you know, on your time on the bench, ways parties try to get continuances when you're on the eve of trial. This is just another one, Judge. But if they truly want to serve us with some alter ego discovery, do it. And we represent to the court, we'll do it on an expedited basis. And when that's done, if they want to serve a motion for summary judgment, do that too. Because we'll respond to that on an expedited basis as well. Because we do believe the bulk of the discovery on this issue has been done. We needed to do some additional discovery. So when that Supreme Court ruled the way it did, we immediately got in touch with them and said, this is what little remaining discovery we think we need. A couple depots and respond to supplement your interrogatories that were already out there. And they agreed to do it, to their credit. They agreed to do it. We're taking depositions tomorrow on this issue. But judge, did they ever tell us, and this is what we'll need in turn? No. No, this, this all came up is an afterthought at the end, Judge. So, you know, if they've got the discovery that they want to do, we'll get that done, and we'll be ready to go to trial on October 7th. We don't need a seven-month continuance to get this done. Unless you have any questions, Judge. Yeah. Sam Berkovich for the plaintiffs. Your Honor, as an opening remark, if Mr. Godfrey's recitation of the law regarding bifurcation were correct, we would see that in every single catastrophic injury case, there would be a bifurcation. And of course, we know that is not the case. The question before the court, as dictated by the Nevada Supreme Court in Verner, is whether liability and damages are separate and distinct. The answer, Judge, is absolutely not. Before I get into the underlying facts, I want to just touch briefly upon the proposal itself that's been brought to you by the defense. That is that we can we concede and acknowledge that information about damages, information about Leland's injuries, is relevant to liability. And they propose to get around it by a series of stipulations, special instructions, and in fact they propose that they could serve as the gatekeeper for any information about Leland's injuries that plaintiffs would seek to offer. I would suggest to you that that is precisely the situation that Werner tells us to avoid, and it would result in a cursory and cryptic presentation of Leland's injuries. As to this case, Judge, and Leland's damages, you've heard a lot about this already in the motion for summary judgment hearing. Leland's damages and the nature and extent of his injuries are absolutely <coughs> intertwined with the defendant's alternative causation theory. Last time we were here, I told you how plaintiff's expert performed their analysis refuting the defense's alternative causation theory. You'll recall that theory is basically that Leland, a previously healthy six-year-old boy, with no prior history, suddenly <coughs> suffered some undefined cardiac episode in the discrete period of time that he was in the defendant's understaffed wave pool and briefly separated from his partner. After that incident, what our experts, both retained and the non-retained treating physicians, have shown is that if he truly had some cardiac condition, you would see it after the fact. And when you look through all of his medical records, all of the constant medical scrutiny, monitoring, diagnostic tests that he's been in for four and a half years now, you would see this cardiac issue, if it truly existed, you would see it pop up. And what our retained experts have done is they've reviewed all of it and they've said, 
you know, I've had the benefit of seeing Leland on constant monitoring for weeks. He continues to follow up with a whole host of different specialists. Not one of those treating doctors has suspected anything wrong with Leland's heart. To the contrary, they say it's absolutely normal. Our medical experts need to discuss the full nature and extent of Leland's treatment to refute the defendant's alternative causation theory. In addition to our retained experts, we also need to have the treating physicians come and testify to the jury as to what they were doing, why they were doing it, and why if Leland truly had some cardiac abnormality, as the defendant suggests, it would have manifested itself. They would have flagged it, they would have noted a suspicion, but they didn't. Your Honor, secondly, Leland's injuries are also highly relevant and interrelated to his submersion time. Your Honor, the defense experts, not ours, but theirs, have opined that the duration of submersion correlates very well with the outcome of the victim. Our experts, accordingly, say that that makes it far more likely that Leland's poor outcome, his severely poor outcome, makes it highly probable that he, in fact, did have a prolonged submersion. That's something Dr. Shannon testified to in his deposition. For these two reasons alone, a full explanation of the nature and extent of Leland's injuries is necessary to show that exactly how these injuries occurred. That is exactly what the Supreme Court found in Burma. You cannot hamstring a party from showing the full nature and extent of the injuries and then attack how they occurred. The Nevada Supreme Court reversed on that basis. We contend that it's absolutely applicable here. Briefly, Your Honor, the other question that the Verner Court directs district courts to consider is whether bifurcation is necessary to lessen costs and expedite litigation. Here, it would send costs through the roof and make this uh, litigation hopelessly complex and result in duplicative testimony. Having it the defendant's way and bifurcating this case would result in us having to call both Dr. Klein and Dr. Weiss, both out-of-state experts, to testify in both phases. They'd be testifying about the same nature and extent of Leland's injuries in both phases. We would also have to call approximately 15 to 20 treating physicians to testify in both phases. It is absolutely unworkable. And for those reasons, bifurcation should be denied. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. No. Thank you. No, last word? Can we just interject this to We just we filed a small little limited um, response okay. just to address while we don't have a dog in this fight, I'll just hobble up here if you don't mind. Um, while we don't have a dog in this fight, um, we were honorably mentioned in two footnotes uh, regarding a, um, I believe the allegation by RNO is that we should now be brought back into the main action after your honor bifurcated those issues out because Arno has now filed cross claims against Bliss Sequoia. Um, as your honor knows, we'll be back here on September 11th on a motion to dismiss Arno's claims. Should any of those claims survive, however, um, make no mistake, you know, make, make no mistake, we will be back in asking for bifurcation of Arno's claims as they mimic, in fact, they join the third party plaintiff's claims which you've already bifurcated. So it's the same issues, the same, you know, ability to extricate and isolate and, and try in 2020, which your honors already ruled for the other third party uh, plaintiffs. So I just want to make a record of that since we were mentioned in the briefing. Okay, thanks. Thank you, your honor. Go ahead, Mr. Goffin. Thank you, your honor. I'll be very brief. Mr. Murkovich's points are <coughs> conclusory, they are not specific. I have made clear, I hope, that <laughs> his concerns, to the extent they are meritorious, can be addressed fairly in this case. The, the notion of medical evidence in the causation phase of the trial is admitted. My point is that we can and will have to litigate that issue to a jury, but they, that jury, does, they can hear about how long his heart had stopped on the pool site. They can hear the plaintiff's expert's theories about, uh, and by the way, there are pending motions on the admissibility of that testimony. But assuming the judge allows that to come in, then they can hear the evidence that the, that the experts say, well, he had to have been underwater a long time because his brain is so badly hurt. Ignoring completely the fact that 23 minutes of cardiac arrest on the pool side is more than sufficient to do that. Whether or not the, key, the EKG strips establish a pre-existing cardiac condition 
and, and rule out submersion as a cause of the cardiac arrest based on the nature of the waveforms on the strips, that's an issue the jury has to hear some medicine about. That is not what I seek to bifurcate out of the first phase of the trial. What I seek to bifurcate out is evidence that is purely directed to how deep the nail goes, how the day in the life film hits this jury, what the economic testimony is from both uh, loss of uh, earning capacity and life care plan, what it's what, what the, uh, the, the the highly emotional, I don't use the word histrionic to be disparaging, but it is histrionics to, to have the parents come in. I'm sure they'll be sobbing their eyes out on the stand. I would if I were them. I don't fault them for it a bit. But that's going to put blinders on this jury. The things that Mr. Murkovich are pointing to in the Verner case are different than they are here. Because here we can clearly separate out liability and causation on the one hand from the extent and, and severity of the damages on the other hand. There is nothing about the day in the life video that informs a jury as to the cardiac condition of this patient. There is nothing in the life care plan testimony, there is nothing in the parent's emotive, emotive testimony that informs the jury on any of those things. Those are the things that we seek to exclude until the plaintiffs fairly win. In the absence of extreme sympathy uh, on their burden of proof on the first two elements. All right. So uh, as far as the bifurcation is concerned, um, I agree that the case is not about sympathy. I mean, the jury may have sympathy, but we instruct them in, in instructions at the beginning and the end that the verdict should not be uh, based on sympathy. Um, I think that generally parties have a right to be at trial. I know that in this case the plaintiffs have said that they're only going to have the leave them there for very short periods of time during, I think, two or three different aspects of the trial. I think that's probably fair. As far as... Uh, the argument that horrible injuries equals prejudice and prejudice equals bifurcation, I, I don't know that I can agree with that in every circumstance. I mean, that's, in some cases, that's probably true. Um, in this case, I think that the, uh, under the Werner case and the analysis that, that they went through, you know, I, I think that liability and damages in this case are intertwined in, to the extent that I think that they probably need to be tried together. Um, Additionally, I, I, I agree, Mr. Godfrey, that there's probably a way to try the cases separately, but I think that by doing so, I, I think we, you know, if that was the rule, that would be fine. But I think the rule is that generally we try cases and, and we don't bifurcate them. We, have, we do that in a case where we have to. And uh, in this case, I, I don't think it's necessary to bifurcate, uh, first of all, in order to have a fair trial. Um, and I think by bifurcating, we, I mean, it, right now it's going to be a five week trial. It, I think we, we horribly extend the, the time that it's going to take to try the case. Judicial economy is, is going to suffer as a result of that. And I just, I don't think that there's a necessity. I think that both parties can get a fair trial, have, have the jury hear it all together, and uh, we can deal with things with instructions and things like that if we need to if you think that there's something that's unduly prejudicial. Prejudice itself is, is not a problem. It's, it's if something is unduly or unfairly prejudicial. And those are the things that we have to deal with at trial. And if that comes up, you let me know and we'll, we'll try to deal with it. But uh, the, the fact that there's, that, that a party is prejudiced because somebody has horrible injuries is not a reason to bifurcate the case by itself. So I'm gonna deny that one. Um, as far as the the continuance, I think I agree with the plaintiffs that the claim that they have is really against Orville Pikins. And the, the fact that RNO is brought in as a reverse veil piercing or veil piercing issue is to try to find somewhere that the money's going to come from, not necessarily because um, they have an independent um, negligence claim against that entity. So, I mean, you have been involved as it relates to Orlifel Pikins for a significant period of time, uh, have been involved in discovery. Um, I think that if, 
I mean, if, if there's additional discovery that needs to be done prior to trial as it relates to R and O, plaintiffs have indicated that they're willing to do things on an expedited basis. If you guys get to a point where something that you want, they're not going, willing to give or not willing to give it up fast enough or something, get me on a conference call. But Your Honor, may I point out that when I first got involved in the case, I specifically and in writing asked for leave to depose certain key fact witnesses, including uh, Leland's parents, Hermione Hanson, William Ray, and I think one or two others. They fought that. If I had been allowed to do that at the time, then things would be very different in terms of fairness. Secondly, if we had lost the motion to dismiss our note, we had all this done by now. Thank you. Or, or at the very least, we would have been able to come before the court on a motion to compel, allowing Arno to do those depositions. I can tell you, Your Honor. So, so those, those fact depositions were taken, though, and if but they're not specific. By me. I get it. I get it. Not by any lawyer for Arno. If, if there are specific issues or questions that you would have asked that you really want answers to, and they're not willing to answer those questions, get me on a conference call. We'll talk about it. We'll see if we can get you the answers that you need. Can we at least allow me, without a continuance, to depose those fact witnesses I've just listed? You want to depose a half a dozen fact witnesses with, with all these parties, all these lawyers again? I do. It's necessary. It's essential. That's it's why I, I, I'm asking you if there's a specific question or specific issues that weren't addressed in the original depositions. You figure out what those are. You let me know if, if they're not willing to address them. Then, then uh, well, you, know, you can give me a There's a very big difference between submitting questions by written interrogatory and asking a witness under oath live in a room certain questions. And, for example, if I ask Mr. Campbell, give me a list of all the questions you're going to ask in the deposition of my client. And by the way, we're putting a witness up tomorrow because we're trying to live on both sides of the sword the same way. We are offering them witnesses to depose tomorrow. We don't get the same courtesy back. If I ask Mr. Campbell to give me a list of all the questions he's going to ask tomorrow, under any rationale, he would say, if he's the same attorney, and I suspect he is, he would say, go to hell. Is the person you're deposing tomorrow already been deposed in this case? Uh, yes, his name is Cass Butler. He is a... Wrong. He's the Sorry. He was in Bankston. Yes. What's the difference? I mean, the way we're playing the game today, Bankston, Gardner makes no difference. If I don't even know what that case is. What are you talking about? There, the other case in which a, a boy drowned in our pool. Yeah. It was a drowning like the next year in the same wave pool, but that resulted in death in that particular case. The point I'm trying to make is that that it's a sort of a reductio ad absurdum argument because if I were to say to them, you, you got this guy's death in another case, why do you got to do it now? That's no different than saying Arno doesn't get the chance to depose the witnesses whose testimony will influence its liability, possibly its existence, and its ability to measure up to the, the obligations it has by contract with its employees, its creditors, its customers. It doesn't get to do anything. You already made this argument, Mr. Godfrey. I'm, I'm not going to grant the motion to, to continue, um, but I am going to ask the plaintiffs and plaintiff's attorneys to cooperate with you to try to get you whatever discovery you need to be prepared for trial, even though we're probably past the discovery deadline. I'll even put time limits on those depositions. I, I'm not going to require them to, to put a half a dozen people up for a brand new deposition. That's why I'm saying I'll do it in a reduced period of time. I understand what you're saying, but um, I'm just fighting for. A I'm not going to. I'm not going to order it right now. So I, I am going to ask them to, to cooperate with you, and if there are specific issues, I mean, you got depositions already taken. But if time is of the essence because we go to trial in October, I submit that we resolve this right now instead of injecting a two, three week delay and then figuring out what the procedural tool was. I'm moving the court for leave to depose those individuals. I will put time limits of four hours on each person, exclusive of colloquy among counsel. That's my oral motion, and I ask that you grant it today. So four hours is not a chance. I'm sorry? There's not a chance I'm going to give you four hours with is people that have already time? been deposed. Is there any period of time you will be? That's why I'm guessing that if you read the depositions of these parties, there may be a half a dozen questions that you would ask that, that hadn't been asked. 
And that's why I don't think that there's a need to take a four hour deposition of a half a dozen different people again. Judge, please give me something. Just give me something. <laughs> you know, that, I have. Down. Give me more than six questions. I mean, the bottom line is I want to pose, I read those transcripts. And if I had been sitting in those depositions when they were taken on behalf of Arno, who wasn't in the case now, I would have made notes to my pad while the other lawyers like Mr. Eisinger were deposing those witnesses, and I would have followed up with the things I thought he missed. I do not want to say in advance what those questions are, because that's not fair to me. They didn't tell us their questions in advance. I want to ask those questions. I, I, I need something, please, Your Honor. I cannot prepare for a fair trial for RO if I don't have at least some latitude to do real discovery for them, to endorse experts for them, to follow motions based upon, to find motions based upon those questions that did not get asked. Please let me do that for our Well, I mean, there's been a long time that Opikins has been in the case. I'm not arguing on behalf of Opikins. I know you're not, but Opikins is the one whose negligence is the, the basis of the claim that's being brought that RNO is involved in. The complaint specifically alleges that RNO was the de facto controller of the water park. I'm going to deny both motions for today. Um, plaintiffs will work with you. Sorry, Mr. Goffrey.